Francois, you've been to Babylon. Now, I haven't had the privilege to go to Babylon. Uh, we did try to go to Babylon, and we tried everything possible to enter. We were in the strong car, which eventually decided that it wasn't going to go that route, so we had to get some other form of transport. But they warned us that we wouldn't get through because of all the military activity. Finally, we tried and tried, and when it got very noisy with the clatter of machine guns, we decided to rather call it a day, particularly since the police told us if we don't turn around, there's going to be a problem. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to ask you, you were fortunate to go there. What was your interest? Why did you want to go to Babylon? Dear viewer, this is going to be exciting. I wanted to take my friend to Babylon, but we couldn't get in. This would have been my fifth entry into the country. Walter, let me tell you what caused me, I had this passion to go to Babylon. You know, Babylon in ancient times was the wealthiest, the most religious, the military, in military terms, the, the mightiest military machine. When Assyria was the world ruler, they even accepted the Babylonian gods. And in Babylon itself, there was a place called the Esquila. This was almost like the Vatican and St. Peter's. People from all over the world came there to worship. So you had to go to a specific place to go and worship. Yes. And then in that Esquila, they had the Etemenanki. That's the ancient Tower of Babel. It's built where the Tower of Babel used to be. And people would worship there. And right on top, they had the statue of Bel Marduk in gold. So, and uh, the name Bab Ilu, as I mentioned before to you, gate through the system to salvation. And then I discovered in the Sumerian language, Ka Dingra means exactly the same the gate to salvation through the system. So the system gives you salvation. But Christ says, I am the door. And uh, we're encouraged to enter into the door, which is Christ himself. So this is a dichotomy of thought there. Yes. There are only two religions. The one says, you can perform, you can attain. The other one says, somebody else performed and attained to what God needs to save you. But that can take us all the way back to the Garden of Eden, where Cain said, these are the works of my hands. They are a perfectly acceptable offering. Here they are. And uh, the other one, Abel, brought the lamb. But the instruction was, from the beginning that everybody had to bring the lamb because it pointed to the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So by his obedience, Abel showed that his salvation relied solely, solely upon the merits of the slain lamb, antitypically speaking. Nothing in my hand I bring simply to the cross I cling. And the more you look at him, the more you realize how a great sinner you are. But uh, the stories in the book, of course, when I was a little boy, fascinated me. That golden image, and especially the story of the three friends of Daniel that landed in the, in the furnace, and then Daniel in the lion's den. Man, I, I love those stories. You know, I like the story about the fiery furnace. Because, you know, we discussed earlier that the devil is the master of reversal. And he has this, this uh, theory that he's put out in the world that if you are lost, you will go to the fiery furnace and there you will burn for all eternity. But if you look at the word of God, God is a consuming fire. If you cling to sin, you will be consumed by the fire. If you relinquish sin, then the fire will do nothing to you. 
So those three friends, they didn't even have the taint of fire upon them. Not even the faintest aroma of fire on them. And the Bible tells us that uh, when Satan was a covering cherub in heaven, he walked amongst the fiery stones. And the redeemed will stand on a sea of glass mingled with fire. So uh, it seems to me that heaven is a very fiery place, but the fire does nothing to you. And Satan reverses it and makes it a place of condemnation. I like that, Walter. But you know, let me tell you a story. I wanted to go there. I organized to go there and I, a few people came with me. We first went to Israel. That was a mistake. Then we went to Jordan and we were sitting in the hotel waiting for our group visa to come from Lebanon. We couldn't get one in Jordan. Just before the bus left for Babylon, they brought the group visa. That was the first miracle. And then there were five. And why people. was it a mistake to go to Israel? Because of the stamp? Oh, yes. So, so what happened there? Loretta, my daughter, had suitcase stickers from Israel with the Israeli ah. <laughs> language on the Hebrew language. So before we got to the border, uh, there were five Iraqis on the bus. And they said, listen, if they see anything of Israel in your suitcase or on your body, you'll be deported back. And Loretta had these stickers with her, and she got such a fright that she ate it. <laughs> <laughs> and then they, they had uh, AIDS test on us. You pay $50. And I said, well, I, I, I'm a, quite an old man. Uh, but they said, no, you must have it. So I had four of these tests, Walter. That was a way of uh, earning money, dollars. So we, after five hours, we went through the border, and then we traveled through the desert, where Nebuchadnezzar, when he came from his victory from Karkemesh, he, he chased the Egyptians up to the place called Hamath, and we were there. He had another victory there, and then he chased them right into Egypt, and then he got the SMS, Dad is seriously ill. Come. So he went that shortcut through the desert, and we drove that shortcut, but it's a long cut. It's, it's not so short. And what you see next to the road, man, <laughs> the ultra cities. And <laughs> and it's the, so cute. And the malls. Yes. You know, the toilets are in such a mess. So one of the ladies, she was very sophisticated. She said to the guide, is there a bush in the desert? <laughs> because the toilets are... <laughs> you don't want to look at them. <laughs> you had smells of the toilets in the Middle East. <laughs> yes. And then she said, uh, he said, y yes. She said, are there snakes in the desert? <laughs> and he said, yes. <laughs> So, but one of the ladies, she was from the South African Broadcasting Corporation. She made a, a series of interviews with me when we came back. She just laughed. She said, this is so strange, you know. <laughs> so it depends on your outlook on life. I told the driver, when you get to the Euphrates River, please stop. And he stopped on the bridge. And in Greek, I called out, Eurosco. I found it. You found the Euphrates River. Oh, well, it's not r particularly small, so. Well, it depends on the season of the year, you know, and somewhere, some places it's very huge, more than a kilometer wide. But I realized that here I see the river mentioned in the book of Revelation. And in ancient times, this was the border for God's people, the Euphrates. The enemies were beyond the border. So this meant much to me. Now this name, Euphrates, 
it has an important connotation in the symbolism of the Bible because it's not only used in a literal sense, it also represents the people and the multitudes that feed Babylon, for example. So when you're standing at it and you're reading about it in the Bible, there are many things that you have to take into account. Oh, this was so precious to me, so precious to me. Uh, it, another time we went down to Ur in the Chaldees, <clears throat> and we stopped again at the Euphrates, and Loretta came out, and she flew. <laughs> she still has the, the marks, <laughs> the scars of the fall at Babylon, the, the Babylon's river, Euphrates. So was she demonstrating the fall of Babylon, or? Man, I think she had something in mind. <laughs> now, Ur, how far is that from it's Babylon? It's six hours' drive from Baghdad to Ur of the Chaldees. Now, as far as I read in history, the city of Ur was a very modern city. Didn't it have... Uh, Toilets that were cleansed with water and uh, very hygienic and uh, inside toilets. And uh, so, this idea that the ancients were primitive and didn't have modern amenities is not borne out by the archaeological record. They were very sophisticated. <laughs> you, you're right. And by the way, Abram heard God's voice calling him out of Babylonia. He was the first person mentioned to come out. So there were actually two calls to Abram, weren't there? The one at Haran and the one at Ur. So Ur was the first call? First call. And then he got stuck. He got stuck at Haran. Yes. And what held him up? Man, they did some business there. And uh, the old man was still alive, Tierra. And he thought, well, I'll stay with the old man. He was getting weak. And but when he died, right at the funeral of his father, the voice came back to him. Leave your family. Leave everything. And archaeology says he never lived in a city again. He spent his entire life living in tents. Now, if you go to the book of Revelation, then you also find two calls out of Babylon. Well, the first one is just an announcement that Babylon has fallen. But the second one is a call out. So Babylon is mentioned twice. There are two calls out of Babylon. Isn't it interesting that there were also two temple cleansings? You know, you have to study ancient Babylon to appreciate the mystical one in the book of Revelation. And by the way, when furniture removers came to him and uh, they asked him, now, where can we... <laughs> take your furniture to. He, he says, I, I don't know. <laughs> so he just... He went with his father. <clears throat> By the way, he also passed Mari. We've been to Mari. This is the uh, uh, <clears throat> fertile crescent. Breasted coined the, the, the term, the fertile crescent. He came through Mesopotamia, the two rivers. He went up to Aleppo. He came down Lebanon, right down to Egypt. It's a, it's a very interesting place to, to visit, the sites where he stopped. So <clears throat> I love the story of Babylon. And where, he was the only, the sole survivor of monotheism. So in other words, God permitted apostasy because his father still worshipped foreign deities. Yeah, syncretism. Syncretism. He worshipped the moon, Ninarta, at, uh, at that Zikhorut. I've been up on that Zikhorut. So that, this has been Israel's sin all along, syncretism. Wor Worshipping the true God in the methods of the other gods and introducing aspects of the other deities into the worship of the God of the Bible. Syncretism. But he was called out and he first only did a halfway step and then finally the full step and he came out so antitypically we are admonished 
to leave systems of worship which practice syncretism and systems of worship that incorporate foreign deities or the attributes of foreign deities. And wherever he pitched his tent, he had a sermon. A lamb was brought. And in a polytheistic society, he proclaimed the truth. There's only one sin bearer, only one plan for salvation. And I like this. Unfortunately, he didn't do this in Egypt, and uh, he had a little problem. There. He was a bit scared in Egypt, yes. Yeah, this beautiful wife. By the way, some scholars say she came from Armenia. She was light-skinned, and we saw her bust in Berlin, the Berlin Museum, the Pergamon. It's, it's wonderful to see how every... There are links all over when you study archaeology in the Bible. They served food on the bus. Oh. <laughs> yes. One cucumber, three rotten apples, and a <laughs> few sour plums. Plums. <laughs> yeah. Well. And did, did everybody get a rotten apple or <laughs> only some? <laughs> All of us. <laughs> and they had a mechanic on the bus as well because it's during the time when they there was an economic boycott you know, from America. So it was an old bus, breaks down, they fix it up, and there we go again. But uh, it was a little different when we got to Baghdad. Man, I couldn't eat a tenth of that big meal. And uh, many statues there. I want to tell you that Saddam was a very loved person by his people. I met a family who accommodated him in their home. He came with his chauffeur, and the chauffeur knocked at the door and said, the president would like to pay a courtesy visit. And they showed me where he sat. And after that, he sent Christmas gifts to the Seventh Adventist Church every year. Oh. So, you know, the, the media paints a person in a black light. And you hate him, but then you get another picture of somebody. But maybe they are practicing Hegelian dialectic, that uh, you have to have a good cop, bad cop situation. You have to have a villain in the story so that they can be a hero. And sometimes there are agendas behind the scenes, in my opinion at least, yeah. which uh, call for such a scenario. And uh, I'm wondering whether the same game is not being played with the current leadership of Syria. That's very interesting, Walter. We'll watch this open space. Yes. <laughs> well, I had the privilege of sitting next to a sheikh. Just look at that man. I felt so important. He's a little bigger than myself. But <laughs> I talked to him. You know, the ordinary citizen, they are kind people. It's the politicians up there that, that cause the problem. Yeah, yeah. And the religious leaders. You're right. They too. So when you come into Babylon, there are two things that attract your attention. The first one is this huge painting which Saddam painted for himself. I also took a picture of a painting in Nineveh where he rides a chariot just like the Assyrians. Uh -huh. And here you see a picture full of symbolism. In front of Saddam, you can see Nebuchadnezzar. So he poses as the new Nebuchadnezzar. Now, I, have a, I just want to ask a, a brief question here. Babylon seems to be the pinnacle in terms of religion, and political power in the ancient world, isn't it so? Whoever controls Babylon is the king of all. Now, isn't it fascinating that this man who depicts himself as the Nebuchadnezzar of his time is deposed by whatever means and another nation takes the place of Saddam Hussein and 
rules politically and militarily to this day. Amidst turmoil, but they are in control. So aren't they, in a sense, also the literal military rulers of Babylon? Well, this is fascinating. I like it. <laughs> Just throwing in some <laughs> thoughts to augment what the Bible has to say, particularly when we get to Revelation chapter 13, the second beast. And uh, I remember that Wesley referring to it just before the time periods mentioned in the Bible come to fruition, says he's not far off. And uh, the attributes are so perfectly aligned to the United States of America, who then, in a sense, literally rule over Babylon in these days. You know, while I looked at the at that painting, it's huge. You see Cyrus at the other end. So what he's telling us, listen, Cyrus conquered me on the 12th of October, 539. But watch my AK-47s. You will not do it again. But the prophecy said, Babylon is fallen. It's I mean, the prophecy also said Babylon would never be rebuilt and uh, it would never be inhabited. But Saddam actually started to rebuild Babylon, but he was halted. Isn't that interesting? Yes. And it's still a museum-like structure. There's nobody that lives there. It is still a haunt for jackals and owls. Yeah. So the second statue that I saw there is that of Hammurabi. Hammurabi was a Babylonian, but he's got a Sumerian name. And that means, calm down, my lord. So whenever you want, uh, your wife wants you to calm down, she must just say, Hammurabi. And uh, <laughs> it's nice to hear something in Sumerian language. And uh, by the way, <clears throat> that, that image was captured by Xerxes, the Ashuras of the Bible from Susan in Iran and taken to Shushan, Shushan and it broke in three pieces and the French discovered it there, mended it and took it to the Louvre and we saw the Hammurabi's law code. Now, Francois, no. this great Babylonian edifice that will never be rebuilt and was such a powerful institution. Typologically, when God destroys anti-typical Babylon, it will never be rebuilt. I like this. It will never exist again. And if you cling to Babylon, then you will be destroyed together with Babylon. That's why God says, come out of her, my people. Now, surely there are lessons that we can learn from the fall of literal Babylon that might apply to anti-typical Babylon as we find it in the book of Revelation. So what really happened when uh, Babylon fell to the Medo-Persians? And in what year was that? 539, 12th of October. Yes. And I, I went <clears throat> to Iran to visit the tomb of Cyrus, which of course is a type of Christ? Yes. You know, I, I love the way God deals with people. He's, he's using a heathen king, and he imprints a typology upon a heathen king to depict the attributes of the coming king that will eventually destroy anti-typical Babylon. Jesus Christ yeah. will destroy it. It was a thrill to visit Pasar Gadai, where I saw his tomb and some of his palaces. There's not time to, to speak about all his attributes, but it fits the coming Cyrus to the T. Why do you say, Francois, that Cyrus fits the, the picture of a perfect type of Christ? What happened to him? That also happened to Christ, for example. You see, the captives 
were in Babylon. And you needed another world power to conquer Babylon and get them out. In other words, to set them free. Yeah. And I think the prophet Isaiah, by the way, he was mentioned 200 years before his birth. His name was mentioned. And then the prophecy, the river would, would dry, dry up. And I think they were watching that Euphrates. <laughs> And eventually it, it was dried up. I'm wondering if uh, one of the Hebrews, maybe Daniel himself, uh, brought that manuscript and showed the conqueror, excuse me, but uh, here you are written in, in the book. And that might have endeared the, uh, the book of the Hebrews to this new ruler. You're perfectly right. Uh, Josephus, in his book, The Wars, mentions the fact. So Daniel was still there in the banquet hall when he came in. And Josephus says he showed him the prophecies concerning him and his interaction with the Jews and how he would free the, the captives to go home. There was also the story that... Uh that he was to be destroyed, just like Jesus was to be destroyed as an infant. And uh, all of those interesting things that are parallel. Yeah, it's interesting. The devil also studies prophecies. He's a master at it. Yes. So he read Isaiah. And the oracles, says history, spoke to Astaiaches, the king, of Egbertana, the capital of the Medes. And the oracles told Astaiaches, by the way, his father Seacheres was part of Nabopolassar and Nebuchadnezzar when they destroyed uh, Nineveh. So the oracle said, listen, somebody by the name of Cyrus would be born into your family. Kill him. But in our next episode, I'll carry on with this okay, fascinating let, let's move on. story. <laughs> What's interesting, Cyrus was also called son in Farsi. Yes. And Nabonides was a co-ruler of uh, Belshazzar in Babylon. And he started to worship Sin. That's a Babylonian name for the moon god. Only Narta is the So Nabopolassar was a, a moon god worshipper. No, Nabonides. 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 Oh, Nabopolassar yeah. was, was his father. father. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he thought by changing his religion and worshipping the moon. By the way, the moon was a very popular deity in those days. And he thought, by worshipping the moon, he would defeat Cyrus, the sun, who was threatening to destroy his kingdom. But uh, if you could read Isaiah 44, 27 and 28, this is a marvelous prophecy, which was fulfilled, and you can write about it in the... Isaiah chapter 44, verse... 27, 28, and then 40, 45, verse 1 and 2. Listen to this. Verse 27 says, Who says to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up your rivers? Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd? Ah, shepherd. So there you have There's only time. one shepherd. Yeah. But he's going to do the work of a shepherd. And he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built. And to the temple, your foundations shall be laid. 200 years before his birth, God predicted this. And also, he said to the Euphrates, be dry. This is interesting. This is interesting. Because there's an antitypical drying up of the Euphrates in the it, book of Revelation. You have to study archaeology to appreciate eschatology in the book of Revelation. So, if this stands for the peoples, the multitudes, the nations, the kings, 
then the support which Babylon had from the nations and the multitudes and the peoples would dry up and they would stand destitute and then they would be destroyed. Now if Babylon stands for religious coalition, a religious coalition can only exist in the light of support from the peoples, the nations, the multitudes, etc., and the kings. And if that support base starts drying up, that means the point of destruction is at hand. Fascinating. You know, he was a brilliant builder. He, Nebuchadnezzar was a, a genius. Uh, you can walk through the ruins of the the ancient city that was restored by Saddam Hussein. And in one section of the city, he had this cold storage. Well, in Babylon in summer, it's very, very warm. Well, it goes up to 50 and more. But when you walk into these storerooms, cold storage rooms, it drops. He, he had these huge blocks of ice coming from the Taurus Mountains down the Euphrates, and he stocked it in this cool storage rooms. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Have you read verse 2? Of chapter 45? Yeah. Well, let's read from verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed. So he's an anointed, just like Jesus he's is anointed. He's a shepherd. He's the anointed. To Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, and to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. There's another miracle because the gates were to keep everyone out. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. That was another miracle. It was predicted. And I think the Jews who lived there, when they saw that night, the gates are not closed. And then the river dried up. They realized this is that it. the king of the east came for their deliverance. Now, who do you think is the king of the east in, uh, in Revelation 16? That's the king of the east who comes from the east. Well, isn't it interesting that the nations worship towards the east because they worship the rising sun. But uh, the retribution also comes from the east. Although he is the actual king of the north, he comes from the east in his retribution to punish the nations. Yeah. In the British Museum, we saw the Cyrus Cylinder. And when you read the Cyrus Cylinder, and you read the fall of Babylon in the Bible, Walter. <laughs> it's one and the same. It's one and the right? same. You know what fascinates me, Francois, is that Babylon is the, the ultimate symbolism used for false religion. Because that's also the place where everybody was united in apostasy towards God, when God confused the languages at the Tower of Babel. So Babylon, the Babylonian religion, is the core of opposition to God. And they also had male, female, and an offspring in their deities. So they had a mother and a father and child worship. That was the Babylonian religion. Now, although Cyrus is a type of Christ, only in the sense that he frees the people, sets the captives free, destroys Babylon, the religion that was practiced is also a false worship system. It's also a system of sun worship, Mitraism. Hmm. And the antitypical Babylon that we find in the book of Revelation will have Babylonian components. So it will have father, mother, child in its worship system. But it will also incorporate the system of worship that the Medes and the Persians brought with them, Mitraism. 
Now, I find it fascinating that Catholicism qualifies on both levels because its structure upon which it is built, its, uh, its plan, is based on Mithraism. But the core is the same as it was in Babylon. And you also have this God-King aspect who is not only the head of the religious realm but also of the political realm. That's why Rome says she has the swords and she has the sword, the ecclesiastical sword, which is higher than the political sword and is subject to it. So we have the same systems. Well, you're looking at a, at, at a picture of the southern palace of Nebuchadnezzar. He used 60 million bricks to complete part of the palace when the Americans said, OK, enough building. Yes, stop. I'm the new king of the north. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's all. Awful, not awful in a bad sense. All inspiring. Yes, when you when you walk it, walk through it, and you realize Daniel, Daniel walked here. And this is in prophecy, a type of the antitypical Babylon. And um, you, the next uh, slide shows the the banquet hall, where a thousand VIPs met. That's without his wives, their wives. So put on another thousand. How many waiters do you have there? <laughs> you know, this was a huge gathering. By the way, people doubted this until they discovered uh, a throne base at Nineveh by King Ashur Nasserpal. Yeah. He invited 70,000 guests. 70,000 guests. 70,000, a feast of 10 days. So, you know, big feasts in those days. Archaeology says, yes, this is, a, this is a, a small party in the light of the bigger parties. But, Francois, don't we have massive gatherings today where religious systems come together in their thousands? And, uh, mm. well... We have the same sort of arrangement as we had in Babylonian times where music plays a very prominent role. And all kinds of music in the days of Daniel. And it evoked certain kinds of emotions. Yes, and if we look at the, the illustrious visits that we had of religious dignitaries, let's say, to the shores of the United States, the music that was played ranged from the great music of the Reformation to metal bands competing with each other in a din of noise, all in the name of worship. Mm -hmm. uh, isn't this a reflection of what there was in the past will be in the present? Yes. And that if you, if you use this music in a certain sense with uh, you know, asyncretistic music, it puts people into an altered state of consciousness so that whatever is said and whatever they experience bypasses the cognitive and only affects the emotion. And then emotion becomes the pinnacle of religion rather than emotion subject to rationality. Paul says, when I sing, I will also sing with my mind. In other words, God doesn't bypass the cognitive, the rational. The devil doesn't want us but to think. Other religions or religious systems seem to have a system where the music is repetitive until the people are in a state of euphoria. And that is considered a special religious experience. Isn't that part of Babylonian worship? Isn't that worshipping the true God in the form and structure of ancient Babylon? Isn't that what syncretism was all about? This is tremendous. So there must have been a big band in the Vale of Dura. By the way, Dura means fortress. Yes. So that 
That gathering was right inside Babylon. So they probably had different genres of music going on at the same time. Yeah, and it encouraged the people to fall down and worship this false god. I like what you say. Now, Walter, another thing that I discovered there was the throne room where Nebuchadnezzar sat on his throne. By the way, they had mobile thrones. It was not stationary. It was brought in to this specific site that you're looking at. That's fascinating because God's throne is also described as a mobile throne. It moves and uh, it has wheels within wheels and the intricacies are so complicated and yet his hand is under it. That which to us seems infathomable is under his control. So Ezekiel wrote that prophecy in Babylon. He was there. So he saw the mobile throne of the king moving up and down. Thank you for that uh, observation. But to think he's big enough to rule his mighty universe, yet small enough to live within our hearts. He wants to make his throne in us. What a thought. But this to me was fascinating, the mobile throne of Nebuchadnezzar. And right there, can you picture it? He sits on his throne with a frown. He wanted to kill all the wise men, Daniel and his friends included. But can you see Daniel coming up to this throne room and in a very polite manner, he tells Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. And you will be replaced oh. by the arms of silver. And they, in turn, will be replaced by the hips of bronze and they by the legs of iron, which will eventually crumble into a coalition of iron and clay. Churchcraft. And statecraft. Yeah. So there you've got the Antichrist in the feet already. And Daniel 7 just expands on it, 8 and 9, and then... The no. Book of Revelation. If you look at that statue, that statue is actually quite fascinating. There's the head of gold, which represents Babylon. That is the head. That is the core and the essence. Then you get the Medo-Persians. There are two elements there. And these two elements are in two arms. And it's fascinating that if you look at that political system, that uh, the Medes and the Persians weren't equally yoked when it came to the aspects of, of rulership. The one was more spiritually inclined in terms of rulership and the other one more politically inclined. So it is also a symbol of church and state working together. And then you get the hips of bronze, which are unitary, and then you get the legs, which again are two. So you have an eastern and you have a western leg. And uh, mm. isn't it interesting that uh, the world is split into the eastern form of religion, which you find in, in, in the Greek form of religion and the orthodox religions, and then the, the western one, which is uh, Catholicism. You also have that double split. But let's continue what you were saying. At this very site that we're looking at, Daniel explained to him that the vision concerns the second coming of Christ. I wonder his facial expression at that moment. And that never left him a, 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 an appreciation of the second coming of Christ. And then he saw Christ in the fiery furnace. And then when he suffered from megalomani, and he became the, the lawn mower, eating grass. And looking up, he saw the second coming of Christ. He saw Christ in the fiery furnace. But before he came to his senses, he first acknowledged that the vision was from God and that Daniel was his prophet. And he accepted it. But when he thought about the consequences, there was rebellion in his heart because that gold which represented him was going to be replaced 
by the iron, uh, by the by the silver, and that by the bronze, and that by the iron. And he thought to himself, I will defy the God of heaven. I will defy this prophecy. I will say to the world, no, my kingdom will never depart. It will stay gold from top to bottom. And I will force everyone to bow down and to worship it. And it was a universal decree. It was a universal decree. And if you didn't bow down to it, you were thrown into the fiery furnace. So there's an antitype coming as far as that is concerned. Now what fascinates me is that when you go to the antitype, which you find in Revelation chapter 13, where you have a description of the conglomerate beast, there's not a statue now which is gold from top to bottom, because there they are depicted in terms of the animals, you know, the lion and the bear and the leopard beast and the terrible beast. But it is a conglomerate beast incorporating all the elements of all the kingdoms. So if we look at modern Catholicism, for example, you have the Babylonian aspects, the, the various saints, the various structures, which you find in, in Mithraism as well. And you have father, mother, child. Then you have also uh, not only the Medo-Persian structure, but you have the Greek philosophy. Natural law, for example, is based on Greek philosophy. The philosophies of the afterlife are based on Greek philosophy. Uh, the philosophies that are espoused in the scientific realms are based on Greek philosophy. So you have this conglomerate which has all the aspects of all the kingdoms and everybody will be asked again to bow before the antitypical statue. Brilliant. <laughs> and of course, you cannot explain the book of Revelation without incorporating the symbolism of Daniel. No. Yeah. They discovered the clay tablet. The name of Cyrus is Farsi in their languages. Is and the night, this is interesting, when Babylon f fell, the god that was worshipped by the Babylonians, it was full moon, it was the end of the Akitu feast. So the moon that was supposed to protect them Failed. exposed the route which Cyrus should go. Because he could to, march at night. Yeah, watch it now. They didn't need torch, torches, nothing. Now, they believe that, as I said before, that Shamash is not as powerful as Ninarta, the moon god. So they believe that Cyrus, who represents Shamash or the sun, would be defeated by the power of the moon, but it turned out to be the exact opposite. That's right. That's right. And it's interesting to read about the Akitu feast. It came just after the Jewish Passover. Now, in the occult world, Francois, they believe that Lucifer is the true son of God, and that he is the eldest son, and that he is the true ruler who had a temporary setback. But he will again rule the universe. He will take back his rightful place. Hmm. So in a sense, they are saying that their deity is stronger than the deity of heaven, and he will conquer. Isn't that the same as the Babylonian concept, saying that the moon god, and if we look at the symbolism of the moon, how often it occurs in the religious systems of the world today. That's interesting. And today it stands, of course, the moon also for the female deity. Now, in that time, I think it stood for the male deity. It was a male deity. But the female deity, Ishtar, is also a moon goddess. And uh, it's particularly in the form of the sickle moon, which represents the womb of the woman into mm. which the son would be born. So who is greater? Well, the, one who is gives, fascinating. the one who gives birth or the one who is born? So the moon will overcome. And uh, in Catholicism, 
it seems as though salvation is more dependent on Mary, which is the female aspect representing the moon, than it is on the sun aspect, which represents the sun of righteousness. So again, you have the moon being elevated over the sun. If you could go to uh, chapter 5, five. of Daniel. Oh, of Daniel. And let's, let's read about the fall of the city. It's chapter 5, verse 24 to 29. 24 to 29. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the inscription that was written, Mene, Mene, Teko, Ufarsen. Can you see a repetition of words there? Yes, there's a Mene and there's a and Mene. another Mene. <clears throat> okay, carry on. And then it gives the explanation. It says, this is the interpretation of each word. Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. So he repeats that twice. Now, that's fascinating. And then Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. And Peres, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Now, I just want to concentrate on <clears throat> many, many. Your days have been counted. It speaks of two rulers. But the Bible only mentions one. And the critic says, uh, here's a problem. There was only one ruler. Until they discovered the Nabunides cylinder. Yes. <laughs> and here he tells us exactly what happened in those days. Where Nabunides it, gives the kingship to his son, Belshazzar. Yes, they were regi regents. They, they ruled together. Now, now Francois, Nabunides, the father, no, the, yes, the father, the father. Nabonidus, the father. He was more interested in the, the ecclesiastical cult. side yes. than in the political side. <laughs> well, this and, is a good observation. And Belshazzar was more interested in the political side and uh, partaking of wine and mixing with women than uh, the father. So what you had here is an is a interesting uh, co-rulership. And uh, do you think we could find something like a many, many in the end times as well, where you have... A, Walter, what a discovery. <laughs> where you have I a, never thought of this. Where you have a political aspect and you have a religious aspect in a coalition. And this was a coalition. You know, at Haran, he built a huge structure to worship the moon, and he, he appointed his mother to be the priestess there. He also built. Who a, appointed his mother? Nabunines, yes, to be he the priestess. His mother. So there was a mother involved as well, yes. as a priestess. And she was a priestess of uh, this Haran uh, worship center. And also, at, they discovered at, at uh, Ur of the Chaldees. He also worshipped the moon over there. So he promoted moon, the moon cult. Now, women as priests were very prominent. <clears throat> now, we're on very dangerous territory here. Perhaps I should leave it just there, <laughs> continue. <laughs> so, and here you're looking at some more of the finds of Nabonidus. Any other discoveries you made there in Babylon? Man, I made something tremendous here. I want to show it to you. You're looking at the procession way. Saddam Hussein restored 180 meters of the procession way. Now, in the Pergamon Museum, you see the procession way, a part of it. Called away, the great German archaeologist transported the glazed tiles to the Pergamon. And there you can... And so the sands actually protected those glazed tiles and they came out immaculate? It's amazing how God preserved those things so that we should uh, have faith in the word of God. Yeah. So once a year, the king celebrated his inauguration as king. And then he did something interesting. They got Belmarduk from the Etamananki 
and they brought him down to the entrance of the procession way. And then they went to Birs Nimrut, not far from there, and they got the, they fetched the god uh, Nabu, and they were placed at the beginning. Any interesting <coughs> at attributes about these two deities? Well, Nabu is the same as the Logos. In the beginning was the word, and the word was, that's also Logos in Greek. So he was the god of literature. Yes. Word, he was the word. Uh -huh. Of course, in a bad religious sense. Yes. But he was a counterfeit. Yes. Yes. So, and then, they got the biggest and the strongest men in Babylon, asking them to carry these two gods. But I want you to no, read no, it. Just for interest's yeah. sake, uh, do some of the modern religions also carry their deities around and portray them through the streets? That's interesting. And does it take place in, in Rome, for example? Walter... <laughs> <laughs> and right. in the old days, they even, well, not so old days, as far back as Vatican II, which opened the door for the incorporation of all religious systems into the one big happy family. There, the political, religious, deified uh, ruler was also carried on shoulders into the pro in procession to uh, the events that yeah. were to take place. The Egyptians also did this. Exactly. So Walter, they are still, he, Saddam wanted to restore this Easter gate, but this is where the two gods met. And then the strong men of Babylon carried them for one and a half k's to the Esagila, the Vatican city in those days, to the Etemandanki, the Tower of Babel. But they couldn't carry these weighty gods too far. Then they collapsed. <laughs> it's like a, a grudge. You know, if you have a grudge weighing 10 pounds or 5 k's, tomorrow it's a few tons. <laughs> Everything gets more heavier as you carry them. So, and now Isaiah saw this in vision. I want you to read Isaiah 46. Isaiah 46. Before you read that, you see on the screen a restoration of that procession way. Yes. This is what Daniel saw that we are looking at. Okay. Bell bows down, Nebo stoops. Their idols were on the beasts and on the cattle. Your carriages were heavily loaded a burden to the weary beast. They stooped, they bowed down together. They could not deliver the burden, but have themselves gone into captivity. In vision, Isaiah saw something that would happen many years later. They couldn't carry it. And then the beasts had to come and transport the two gods to the Etemanonki. They tried this for many years, but they never succeeded to carry their gods. What does verse 4 says? Verse 4 says, Even to your old age I am he, and even to your gray hairs I will carry you. I have made you, and I will bear. Even I will carry and will deliver you. So here we have this contrast between false religion and true religion. Wonderful, you've got it. <laughs> False religion carries its deities <laughs> and has images and bows down to them and uh, has them in procession through the streets and has special places of worship where you receive special graces in the form of indulgences when you go there. And true religion, in an omnipresent God, doesn't have to go to a particular place, spend a fortune to go there, but can find the deity of heaven as close as your closet and your very environment in which you exist at any moment in time. 
Isn't it marvelous to serve a God where you don't have to buy an expensive ticket to go and see whether you can have a meeting with him, but you can just go down on your knees and talk to him at any stage. And if you are wearied and heavy laden, you're never too heavy laden for him to carry you. I like this. And dear viewer, what Walter said is so true. If you are worshipping a religion which tells you to get to perfection, <laughs> you will drop eventually. But if you allow God to carry you, you will reach heaven. So relax and let God take care of your salvation. Well, thank you for that. I want to tell you something else, man. When I stood there, I thought of Loretta. It says he will carry us until old age. When Loretta was born, she was a premature, but in those days the nappies were not waterproof. And uh, on a Sabbath morning before... I don't think the Americans will know what you're talking about. I think you just used the word diaper. Okay, diaper. Thank you. <laughs> if we have Americans looking at this. And when she sat on my lap, they, I suddenly felt heat, something warm, and I realized... You were getting a gift. <laughs> and then she would vomit on my black suit, you know, with a white spot here. But, you know, she was in my hands, making a mess in my arms. But I love that child so much, I didn't drop her. And God is trying to tell us. <laughs> As babies, we all made messes in our parents' arms. And we are making a mess in the Father's arms as well. How often we, you know what, but he will not drop you. And while I stood at that procession way, this thought came to me, my God will not drop me if I offend. He'll keep me and he'll carry me. The righteous fall many times, but they get up again. Yeah. So it's not that you intend to offend. It's not that you intend to be lost or, or to be unfaithful. You have this burning desire to be faithful. And through trials that God brings to you, he educates you into the consequences of this thing called sin until it becomes abhorrent. And by beholding his beauty, you become changed. Do you remember what I shared with you concerning overcoming, be victorious? Tell me. The participle. <laughs> Explain it. I was so worried, you know, I wanted to reach perfection. And the more I tried, the more I disappointed myself. My religion was one of works and performance, and I failed. And then I checked the Greek. <laughs> and overcoming in Greek is the participle. It's like walking, singing. It's a process where you strive to overcome. But you sit with this terrible fallen human nature. I like the way Luther puts it in, in Latin. Simul, justice, et peccator. Simul is a word also in English. Simultaneous. Justice. Yes. Good. Luther says, at the same time you are saved, and at the same time you are lost. So you are justified by grace, but you have a fallen nature which is covered by the righteousness of Christ. And you have to crucify that fallen nature. Every day. Yeah. It's not attaining to perfection. It's a process. It's a process. And then when I discovered that, no, what about I, I Christ? relaxed. What about Christ? He was the perfect example. Yeah. Then it's not the... <clears throat> what is it then? Then it's in the perfect. Yeah. When it speaks of his victory, it's complete. The less I, it's done. He's the victor. And you know what, Walter? I, 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 I meditate on the leaves of the tree of life. What does it say about those leaves? 
there for the healing of the nations. In other words, the process of healing will continue throughout eternity. And we will grow into the full stature of men and women in Christ. But the process has to start here. Yeah. And I cannot relax and say there's no consequence to my decision to follow Christ. I have to say, here I am. Take me. I have to open the door and say, come in. Now, Christ cannot come in if it's a mess in there. And I am not capable of my own strength to get rid of the mess, so I invite him to come in and clean up the house. But so, tomorrow the house will be dirty again. But Paul says, I have to die daily. <laughs> yes. So Only at the I'm second coming, <clears throat> this fallen nature will be gone. Can you imagine? No conflict in your mind. Living for eternity with lovely, kind people. You can trust anybody there. I think it will be a marvelous place to be. God wants you in a better place soon. Let him gain the victories for you. Keep on confessing. Keep on getting up when you've fallen down. Walter, I must tell you in closing, I went to the Adventist church in Baghdad. It's a beautiful place. A beautiful place. And I saw one lady with a funny nose. It, it looked different to the, to the ordinary Iraqi people. Was it a funny nose or was it an interesting nose? Okay, let's say an interesting. And thank you for correcting my, my grammar. English is my second language and I battled to talk to you in English. But... Uh, I want to tell you more about this lady in our next lecture. How they, this was the couple where Saddam Hussein, Hussein visited them. Oh. And uh, she was an Assyrian. And you have pockets of Assyrian churches worshipping God and Christ. I was so surprised when I, when I got this news. But this was a tremendous experience in the church. They asked me to preach there. And I spoke of Daniel <laughs> to the Babylonians. Walter, in closing, <clears throat> tell us about a storm is coming relentless in its fury. I believe that we are on the precipice of this world's history. And that momentous decisions will have to be made by every individual on this planet. Just like Israel of old had to make a decision. Are they going to accept the Messiah, the true Messiah, who had been prophesied and whose very time had been prophesied in the book of Daniel? Were they going to accept him or were they going to reject him? They chose to reject him. We have no king but Caesar. And eventually, they even chose to eliminate his followers. And they started the process in the stoning of Stephen. And probation closed. And the terrible consequences of the destruction of Jerusalem was upon them. And I believe that the antitypical world that we are living in here is about to make the same mistake. If we say all deities are equal and we can be in a coalition of religions as long as we don't mention the name of Christ, then we are also saying we have no king but Caesar. Now there's a literal Caesar with the literal connotations of that literal Caesar. Literal Caesar had the title Pontifex Maximus. There's another Caesar ruling today who has the title Pontifex Maximus. Came from Babylon, then to Pergamon, and then to Then Rome. to Rome. And he sits on a great white throne and says that he is God. And it seems as if all the religions cannot wait to gather in Rome. And now we have a unity coming of Protestant churches, evangelical churches, and the great religious systems are already 
uh, in union and have decided to form this great coalition of the unity of religions. Assisi is the meeting where all the religious systems, including the atheists, come together. And it seems as if the morality of this antitypical Caesar is being accepted as the norm and the standard of morality in the entire world. I'm fascinated that he made a speech the other day in which he likened the disciples and Jesus to ISIS. This is rather an astonishing thing. Not, not literally in the sense like I'm saying now, but in the sense that ISIS wanted to conquer the world with their religion. So the disciples also wanted to conquer the world with their religion. That's a poor metaphor. It's a very poor metaphor because the disciples never beheaded anyone who didn't accept this invitation. Hmm. Neither did they blow up anyone who didn't accept this invitation because Christ has a religion of freedom of choice. But it seems as if everybody is storming to the gates of Rome to accept this new king called Caesar. When I, for myself, have decided I have no king but Jesus. Mm. I cannot wait for the theocracy that is coming. Because every political system that has ever existed on this planet has failed. But there is one that will stand forever and that is the kingdom of Christ. And that is the kingdom that I am waiting for. I have no king but Jesus. Thank you, Walter. Dear viewer, don't miss the next presentation. We're going to visit some more in uh, Iran where Cyrus was born. When Nebuchadnezzar met his dear wife, you cannot afford to miss the exciting new lecture coming up. God bless you. And as Walter says, there's only one king. Make him the king on the throne of your heart. Thank you.